This is Dr. Ben White with the Rational Wellness Podcast, bringing you the cutting edge information on health and nutrition from the latest scientific research and by interviewing the top experts in the field. Please subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast on iTunes and YouTube and sign up for my free ebook on my website by going to drwhites.com. Let's get started on your road to better health. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you so much for joining me again today. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, please go to iTunes and give us a ratings and review. That way more people will find the Rational Wellness Podcast. Our topic for today is autoimmune diseases with Dr. Holly Lucille and how to treat them with a functional medicine approach. Autoimmune diseases have been on the rise for at least the last four decades, and there are between 80 and 100 different autoimmune diseases, and at least 40 other diseases are suspected to have an autoimmune basis. According to Dr. Thomas O'Brien, if we include diseases that have an autoimmune basis, autoimmune diseases are the third leading cause of death in the United States, since most of these diseases are chronic and often life-threatening. And in fact, if we include heart disease as a autoimmune disease, autoimmune disease is probably the number one cause of death. Some of the more common autoimmune diseases include Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, asthma, Hashimoto's hypothyroid, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, psoriasis, alopecia, Crohn's, multiple sclerosis, and type 1 diabetes. Our immune system is designed to protect us from bacteria and viruses and parasites and to protect our tissues from damage that occurs on a regular basis. What happens in autoimmune diseases is that our immune system becomes dysregulated and it starts to attack our own cells and organs. The conventional medical approach is to treat autoimmune conditions either by controlling the symptoms such as providing thyroid medication in the case of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or by using medications that suppress the immune system, such as corticosteroids, chemotherapy agents, or the newer injectable TNF-alpha blocking agents like Humira and Remicade, which are in very common usage today. These drugs simply block part of the immune system, and this is a problem because you do need a properly functioning immune system. And these drugs have potential side effects like infections and cancer. But functional medicine, in contrast, treats autoimmune diseases by trying to look at the underlying factors that lead to the immune system getting dysregulated. These include leaky gut, food sensitivities, toxins, infections, nutritional deficiencies. This is very important. If I have a patient with Hashimoto's hypothyroid, and most women in the US with hypothyroid have Hashimoto's, and all this patient is treated with is with thyroid medication, which don't get me wrong, is very helpful. Um, It doesn't do anything for the smoldering fire of the autoimmune disease that has been attacking the thyroid gland, and chances are that will continue. The patient may need higher dosages of thyroid medication over time, or they may end up with another autoimmune disease. So not just regulating the thyroid, but also putting out the smoldering fire of autoimmunity is crucial for this patient's long-term health. And that's something that we want to discuss today. Dr. Holly Lucille is with us today. I'm very happy that she's here. She's a naturopathic doctor, a registered nurse, and a nationally recognized educator, national national products consultant, and TV and radio host. She's the author of several books, including Creating and Maintaining Balance, A Woman's Guide to Safe Natural Hormone Health, and The Healing Power of Trauma Comfrey. Dr. Lucille is the host of the popular podcast, Mindful Medicine, and she's in private practice in Los Angeles. Dr. Lucille, thank you so much for joining us today. It is my pleasure always. And you know, I've never thought about this as much as I was thinking about this when you were talking about, I love the name of your podcast. It just makes so much sense. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. (laughs) Rational wellness. 
<laughs> we've had a few challenges getting started today. And of course, just as we started, one of my lights went out, but <laughs> always so. It'll be epic though. So how did you become interested in treating autoimmune diseases? You know, gosh, it, like I have become interested in treating anything else. It's, it's, it, my practice informs me. Uh, my patients informed me. I mean, like you, I hold um, a license to practice medicine and I'm, you know, I need to have continuing education credits uh, each renewal period and certainly get those and more and always are continuing to learn. But I have to tell you what I have to pay attention to, what gets my attention most is what walks through my door. And then, as you said, in the last decade for me, I have seen it, the increase of people walking in actually diagnosis in hand, right? So they've already been through the conventional Western reductionistic process and um, they've been diagnosed with one, two, maybe other autoimmune diseases, or I've got these more complex cases that with the least invasive methods uh, I'm used to using all throughout my last 20 years in, in this career that could really get people far in their wellness and healthcare desires aren't working anymore. So I'm thinking, hey, what's going on? And more and more, those folks we've ended up diagnosing with one autoimmune disease or another and having to get in there and treat and identify the causes of those. So it's really been my practice that has informed me uh, to get me started down this, you know, sort of naturopathic functional medicine, uh, comprehensive overview of helping people with autoimmune diseases. Uh, why do you think women are so much more affected by these? Yeah, it's true. You know, I mean, more than 80 immune mediated diseases that we looked at and seven in a hundred people are affected, right? 25% um, of men, 75% being women. And I don't think that we know all of those answers. I know that there are some associations with the X chromosome when it comes to sort of a genetic predisposition it, 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 where a certain X linked gene appears to be critical. And then I think on the other side, um, testosterone, if we look at it, it reduces the number of B cells, which is, you know, that type of lymphocyte that releases those harmful antibodies. So we're maybe looking at more protection for men because of their higher levels of an androgen like testosterone. Oh, interesting. I was thinking that maybe estrogen was, was a factor in this. Yeah, not so much as being protective at all. Um, I think we're looking more at being able to, in treating, look at optimizing hormones, um, especially the androgens when we're looking at DHEA and testosterone. That's what my clinical uh, assessment has been. Interesting. I've really been enjoying this discussion, but I'd like to pause for a minute to tell you about our sponsor for this podcast. I'm proud that this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast is sponsored by Integrative Therapeutics which is one of the few lines of professional products that I use in my office. Integrative Therapeutics is a top tier manufacturer of clinician design, cutting edge nutritional products with therapeutic dosages of scientifically proven ingredients to help our patients prevent chronic diseases and feel better naturally. Integrative Therapeutics is also the founding sponsor of TAP Integrative. This is a great resource for education for practitioners. I'm a subscriber to TAP Integrative. There's videos, there's lots of great information constantly being updated and improved upon by Dr. Lee Salschuler, who runs it. One of the things I really enjoy about TAP Integrative is that it includes a service that provides you with full copies of journal articles, and it's included in the yearly annual fee. And if you use the discount code WHITES, W-E-I-T-Z, you'll be able to subscribe for only $99 for the year. And now, back to our discussion. Let's talk about Hashimoto's hypothyroid and, and what patient, percentage of patients in the U.S. who have hypothyroid have autoimmune disease. And, you know, when you've seen some of these patients, what do you find is some of the more interesting triggers for this? Yeah, so depending on the reference that you look at, from looking at all of the Americans that have hypothyroidism, you're looking at 90 to 97% of them having an autoimmune-related hypothyroid, so Hashimoto's. And it's interesting, and I'm sure you've had this conversation, and I've had this conversation with 
many esteemed endocrinologists um, in wondering if those are the stats, hey, why don't you run antibodies, TPO, you know, thyroid, uh, thyroid globulin, why? And their, their answer, I think, from their scope of practice is quite good. It's because they wouldn't change the treatment, right? right? So if you've got a high TSH, a relatively low T4, which is pretty much all that they're going to see, you're going to be diagnosed with hypothyroidism and then given a thyroid replacement therapy, most likely Synthroid or what have you. And of course, our argument is, okay, as you said in your introduction, that's great. We can get TSH within normal limits again, but we've got this raging fire of inflammation behind us that I don't believe the symptoms are going to stop for that patient just because their TSH was, is within normal limits. And also that autoimmune disease can continue on. And I've seen it way too many times. And I'll tell you where with women, and we don't really have a test yet for this, but premature, and I say that clearly, premature menopause because their ovaries end up being affected. Another gland, right? Being attacked by the patient's own immune system. Um, and I've seen it over and over and over again in my untreated Hashimoto's patients. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's true. The, uh, the, the average patient who goes to their medical doctor doesn't get the thyroid antibodies um, measured. They basically just look at TSH, and that's all they really focus on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 I have found a number of patients who had elevated TPO antibodies and actually didn't have uh, symptoms of thyroid disease. And I always find this uh, interesting phenomenon. And I feel as functional medicine practitioners, one of the things that we can do is try to prevent some of these autoimmune diseases. And if we can see some of these autoimmune markers happening, what it's telling me is, is that there is this underlying smoldering fire and maybe now we can put it out before their thyroid gland gets so destroyed that they actually need thyroid medication. Yeah, it's a tricky thing with, um, I always say, you know, you can't treat lab tests, you have to treat people. But in this, in this situation, if the patient isn't really presenting with overt symptoms, you have to look at that lab test and go, huh, is this an earlier stage of the disease appearing, right? Yeah. Um, is this something that could be uh, prevented? And I would say yes. Because the other thing too, which I've found very interesting in the patients that I could get a hold of their labs all the way back, is that if you think about if that thyroid starts to get attacked, and of course we remember that at the thyroid level is where the thyroid hormone is made, okay? T4 inactive, we have pro-hormone almost, we haven't really identified a receptor for it. We have four months of stored T4 in our thyroid. So at first, if you catch it early, and I've seen this, you've got that T4 being released in flush into the bloodstream, converted um, into T3 in the peripheral tissues, of course, and you'll actually see a hyperthyroid. Uh, almost, and you catch it early, it's Graves' disease, honestly. But that subsequent attack over and over again, you're going to start seeing uh, a decline in, in, in the hormones being produced, and also, of course, your blood work is going to then start showing. But I think when we look at thyroid as a whole, if a patient is having any abnormalities in their blood work, they are already in dire straits from a tissue perspective. It's been going on for quite some time. So um, I think when the biggest take home is when we're looking at thyroid health and we think about metabolism, aerobic and anaerobic in every single cell in our body, um, it's so important to know that it's not a numbers game and look at it very comprehensively. Certainly those lab tests, especially if they're not presenting with overt symptoms and you've still got those antibodies on the rise, that is a great opportunity. Prevention is always the cure. So um, what are some of the triggers for autoimmune diseases, for thyroid and others? So just think about it. Um, certainly, uh, we're gonna, there's a genetic predisposition I've seen for sure, environmental influences. You think all the way through um, food sensitivities, infections, medication, poor food quality, poor air quality, poor water intake. Um, there's so many contributing factors. And that's really the key, I think, is to help identify um, what are the contributing factors that are spurring on the body's ability to attack itself. 
So when you have a patient who presents in your office and uh, they have some indication or symptom of uh, autoimmune disease, how do you work that through? How do you decide to try to figure out whether it might be a food sensitivity or a chemical toxin exposure or a, one, uh, an infection, a, a mold exposure? How do you work that up? Yeah, it's a lot. You know, I mean, it, it's, it, it's tricky, but I think that with functional medicine and naturopathic medicine, we've got all the tools. And I do think it first starts with that, um, that clinical acumen. Uh, you know, I mean, here, you and I live in the Los Angeles area, and we just had four or five days of straight on rain, and, and thankfully, because we need it so much. But I have to tell you, the buildings that I have been in in the past week or so, um, you know a lot of people are exposed to mold. And that is an infectious agent that, if you do not identify it, um, can con continue to contribute to a chronic autoimmune disease. So getting that history from a patient, looking at their environmental exposures, um, drilling down into that specific part of the case is extremely important because we've been, you know, if you're 30, 40, 50 years old, you've been living on this earth for that time, we've been beat up a little bit because of our increasingly toxic environment. And so that is just a place where you do that investigation. And of course, you know, the way that I play it in my practice is, my, my clinical hypothesis is so important. And for everybody, it's individualized because everybody comes with not only different genetics, different biochemistry in a sense, but also their different histories. And then we've got these incredible functional medicine labs to confirm our clinical suspicion. So as I said before, least invasive methods to diagnose and treat. And I used to get away with a lot less in helping people sort of, you know, clean up their diet a little bit, get moving a little bit more, open the among trees, and it, it'd be amazing, right? The outcomes from a clinical perspective. You've got to work really hard to drill down and understand all of these, envir these environmental triggers, but also, you know, there's gut health, and we can talk much more about that because that's extremely important when we're talking about the immune system. So, it, you know, the, the testing, I think, is really important, um, and also that good clinical acumen, taking that case, and especially if you are at all um, sus suspicious of an autoimmune condition. Yeah, uh, Alessio Fasano, one of the experts on autoimmune diseases, he talked about having this triad where you have food sensitivities and you have leaky gut as being a major factor. So there's no doubt that gut health is super important for the eating. Oh, you think about it because, I mean, you're looking at 70% of the immune system, of gut-associated lymphatic tissue, we've got our stomach acid, we've got these tight junctions, right? When there's any amount of dysbiosis, whether it be a bacterial dysbiosis or a fungal dysbiosis, you know that those tight junctions get a little bit more loose because of um, those endotoxins that are, are produced. And then we've got larger protein molecules getting into our bloodstream. Our immune system is like, hmm, what are you doing there? And what does it do? It mounts a response, exactly what it's supposed to do. But if that continues on, that gets chronic. And I think that's a huge underlying cause for autoimmune diseases. So let's say you have a patient in your office and there's no obvious cause. You know, you, you go through their history. They, they don't tell you anything suggestive of mold exposure. Of course, it could be, you know, they, they think they're sort of okay with gluten. And, you know, there's nothing obvious. What, what, you know, what direction do you go? Do you do a stool panel? Do you do, you know, do you do serum lab work? What, yeah. Do urine testing? What, what direction do you tend to go to? And I realize there's intuition and, and other things yeah. that go into this, but. Yeah, so I look at other um, common contributing factors uh, like vitamin D deficiency. So I want to make sure I'm checking that out. You know, iodine is really important because iodine deficiency, I think, is a contributing cause um, to autoimmune disease, especially Hashimoto's, but very controversial subject because, you know, because if you have iodine deficiency, what do you have? You have, because iodine, obviously, T4, T3, we're looking at tyrosine being the T part and the, the three or four being iodine molecules. And if that iodine deficiency is there, you've got these little friends that hang out on the periodic table, the other halogens that are toxic that can come in and sort of create and stimulate this immune response. Um, like so fluorine, we'll go to, for example, fluorine, you know. Yep, bromides, chlorine, all of those, those things. And so, um, so I, I want to understand that. I will jump to treatment because I have seen if you give iodine, it can spur on an autoimmune reaction. But in my clinical experience, the way that I get around that is to make sure that the free radical load is down, the antioxidant status is up, especially with selenium. Once that, I'm assured that is happening, 
I can start successfully um, putting iodine on board and watch those antibody numbers and they continue to go down. So that's that's my quick tip right there. So are you talking about a modest, modest dosage, like 100, 200 micrograms? Or are you talking about milligram dosages, like some practitioners recommend? You know, it's the... Uh... I think, well, I definitely start slow okay. because we want to watch the antibodies. And obviously there's been some controversy. And I do think that uh, dosing iodine... Uh, Heavy doses of iodine can be more harmful to Hashimoto's if we're not doing it in the correct way, which I think is that antioxidant status needs to be preserved first. And so then I start very, very slow and go up and watch the antibodies. But you know, the other things too, I'll run inflammatory markers, certainly C-reactive protein, homocysteine, that'll give me an idea if I should do more genetic testing. Um, you had mentioned a great lab. Uh, it's fairly new, the test for cytokines. I think it's oh, yeah. the CytoDX from um, Diagnostic Solutions. That's a yeah. nifty. Nifty serum blood test. Right, that tells us about Th1, Th2 balance, which is an important factor in um, autoimmune diseases. Talk about that. Absolutely, I mean, that's the, the, the fun thing about sort of thinking through this in the way that we do is that there's always a balance, right? Um, and, there, and there's a balance with the immune system. Those pro-inflammatory cytokines are important because they're gonna react if we need them to. But I think what happens is once they become you know, once it comes out of balance and those Th1 mediated cytokines, which we see all the time elevated in autoimmune diseases, um, they're just, they just take over. So our goal is to understand that imbalance and get things on board that we can actually balance that out and quell that inflammatory response. Uh, for those listening who aren't familiar with uh, the importance of iodine, I just wanted to clarify a few points. It, uh, Sort of the history of hypothyroidism in this country is uh, we used to have commonly people would have hypothyroid from iodine deficiency and they would get an enlargement of their thyroid called the goiter and there were parts of the country in the Midwest called the goiter belt and then we started um, adding iodine to the salt. You know, it was a nationwide supplementation program to take care of this. And interestingly, you know, rates of uh, hypothyroidism from iodine deficiency plummeted, basically went to super, super low levels, but then autoimmune thyroid took off. And we've seen the same phenomenon in countries around the world where they went from having goiter um, and causing hypothyroid to supplementing with iodine and then autoimmune diseases taking off. And so iodine is super important in your body making um, thyroid hormone. And, and part of the process, though, in making thyroid hormone is that it produces a lot of free radicals, and those free radicals can create problems. So you were mentioning taking antioxidants to help quell that if you're using iodine. Okay, yeah. let's, so let's go back. Um, <laughs> so uh, Nice clarification. <laughs> so let's say... You're working up a patient, and you think they might have some food sensitivities. What uh, what what approach will you tend to take? Will you either one um, say let's just cut out gluten, dairy, soy, um, do an elimination diet, or will you use one of these panels um, to look at food sensitivities from Cyrex or one of these other labs? What do you think is is the best way to go about this? Yeah, you know, and I hate to keep coming back to this, but it's just the gosh darn truth in my practice. Everybody's so different. You know, there are people that I can say, listen, I need 100% gluten-free for 60 days, and I'd like you to go on an AIP, so an autoimmune sort of paleo-type diet. And they'll do that. They'll do that sight unseen. They don't need to see a test. They don't need to see whether it's um, acute allergies that they might have, even these delayed sensitivities. If I do food allergy testing, I like to do it all just to get, get that in there, IgG, IgA, IgM. Um, all of it. But some people are okay, just let's clear things out. If I choose to do, if we choose to do, because also, and, and people don't pay me to mind their pocketbook, but when we're, when this is a chronic case, and there's a lot of different things to, to suss out, we're looking at, you know, I, I did a talk, Ben, I, I'm sorry I'm interrupting myself, but there's over a, a, a couple weeks ago in Hawaii um, called Superpowering Your Patient Self-Care, and my whole talk was centered around the idea that I end up teaching in my practice all the time, because dossier, right? Doctor in Latin means to teach. Here, take this, like as you said, um, Humera. Uh, here, take this is easy, easy medicine when it comes to uh, an autoimmune disease. You 
get that prescription, you take it down, pay your copay, open that bottle up. It's easy medicine, it is. What we ask people to do when we're trying to excavate and identify and treat the cause and, and have an outcome of being able to, you know, not to shed this diagnosis and not have this be so as chronic or as debilitating and as life-threatening it can be, it's not easy. And it's not inexpensive sometimes. And so I'll, always, I'll also take that in mind. I mean, if, if money wasn't an issue, I think I would love all the data in the world because right. then I'd have it, I'd, I'd let my patients see it, we could connect the dots together, they could have more of an adherent, you know, like compliance is like, yeah, she told me to do this. Adherence is a faithful attachment to something. And I have those patients that just need to see it. So if they need to see it, I'm going to run it. I'm just going to get that data so we have it, so they know it, and they can be more motivated. Yeah. So uh, what you're referring to, for in, in case there's some patients listening who aren't familiar with this, is there are a bunch of uh, functional medicine-oriented labs that are available, except that they tend to be fairly expensive and they tend to be out of pocket. So it's not unusual to run a big panel of, of food sensitivity tests. It's very comprehensive, uh, but it could cost a thousand bucks and it won't be covered by your insurance. And so patients are used to just paying a, you know, $20 copay and getting all your lab tests done might come as a shock. People are used to the functional medicine world would, would understand now. You know, and I, I have to say this because I've been using it clinically um, with a certain amount of success. Whatever I'm doing to get started, and if we are collecting more data, I will have people sort of just follow a modified blood type diet, kind of just ruling out their food sensitivities by avoiding their avoid foods based on Diadamo's work. Um, it gets us started. It gets us started cleaning up the diet, um, excavating certainly processed foods because that's what it does. Um, gluten for sure. So we'll get some parameters on board first and while we're getting more data. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So um, let's say you have a patient and you suspect maybe they ha might have some exposure to toxins. How will you try to suss that out? Yeah, so um, certainly we want to avoid any other exposure. So a lot of education on um, all of that. I mean, I always use ewg.org, the environmentalworkinggroup.org, as a resource, as you do for my patients, because it's all right there. When it comes to the things that they put on their skin, health and beauty aids, when it comes to the cleaning supplies. So that, that dossier, that education in avoiding exposure is primary. We've got to stop it, whatever the offending agent is. And then, of course, you have to, in, in the way that we talk about it, open the amunctories. We have to get those detoxification pathways um, really cranking. That's extremely important. We've got to start helping to get things out that might have accumulated and that are continuing to contribute to this. For, for those of us who aren't familiar with the homunctories, can you explain? Yeah, so... When we think, so amunctories is this old word, um, it's, it's where we get things out. So if you think about detoxification uh, and how we get out toxins, it's through defecation, it's through urination, it's through perspiration. I mean, heck, even a good cry, right, is very, emoting is, can be very detoxifying. So this is where um, we want to look at the detoxification pathways, and of course the gut is involved in that too. Uh, liver, very important, and all of the nutrients that drive the cytochrome P450 pathways in the liver to do that, supporting those, and as well, then um, movement, uh, saunas, steam, uh, like I said, uh, staying hydrated, very important. Right. So for, for those who aren't familiar with the concept, if we get exposed to toxins, let's say you have mercury from eating fish, or I, I just heard about a new uh, test from Doctors Data that looks at um, heavy metals from uh, metallic implants, which is kind of interesting that, you know, yeah. a lot of us are, as, as we're getting older, are getting knee replacements and other joint replacements, and we're told that they're using titanium and other substances are totally inert, not a problem. Well, it turns out that some of these metals are getting into our system and creating problems. Um, uh, what happens is, is your immune system detects that there's this toxin there, and then there's this cross-reactivity. So what happens is the immune system that's attacking the metal 
then recognizes some protein in your body that's maybe in your thyroid gland or your liver or somewhere mm -hmm. else, and it starts attacking that organ. So that's how we end up with a, these autoimmune diseases from exposure to toxins. Yeah, Ben, there's two, two cases that come to my mind when you're talking, um, and this is, and this is the, the art of medicine, right? This is the, the process that we go through. But um, one of, I mean, she, bless her heart, riddled with um, a couple, she walked in with scleroderma and as well Hashimoto's, and I'm thinking, boy, what is going on here? Wanted to run a genetic panel just because we'd had some genet a family history with her, but guess what? They're family-owned dry cleaners all throughout the <laughs> Los Angeles area. So she had, and she, that she, after school, where would she go? What was her first job? She had solvent exposure. Right. In her entire growing up years. Um, that was huge. Another woman where, you know, when you get this down, it's great because you can start to see people get better um, and your antibodies come down. Because once again, if we're looking at Hashimoto's, you and I are not just looking at that TSA. We want, my metric is those animals, well, my metric is the patient has to start feeling better. That's number one. Number two, we want to see those antibodies come down because we want to see that the fire is not like raging, that it might just be there still and we can do things to put it out. We want to see those antibodies come down. When that's not happening, I always have to say, okay, um, why? Because the body has an, 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 an ability to heal itself. We, that's sort of our, uh, one of our biggest tenets. And so what's in the way? Where are obstacles to cure? And that was another one. I, uh, this woman was doing everything, and I thought, you know, and her mercury, finally we did this testing, and her mercury was off the charts. So as soon as we effectively detoxified her mercury, and she didn't have any mercury amalgam. She was only 29 years old. And so hers was mostly her sushi habit. Um, and so as soon as we were able to detox that mercury, her antibodies with everything else she had been doing uh, and had to have on, having on board started to drive down. Hex. My last case that I'll tell you about. We're by, talking by the about way, how did you measure the mercury and then how did you get rid of it? Yeah, so um, very extensive. I used a Nutri-Eval for her, uh, which is a, okay. it's a comprehensive test from Genova. And just for the patients that are listening or, or watching, you know, if you have the right insurance, we can tuck it under something called Pay Assure. And um, there are some interesting ways that we can make these sometimes cost-prohibitive tests cost-effective. Um, and so that's where that popped up because I was, um, I had felt like she had done so much. So I really wanted to do the Mac Daddy map just to see what else maybe I was missing. And that's really a nice test to do that. No, we and use that also, test a lot. That's a great, it's a great nutrition panel that also includes heavy metals through serum. Yeah. And you can see those malabsorption markers. You can see dysbio dysbiosis markers. And for me, that's kind of like a great test to do because it can spin off and make me focus and concentrate on additional testing in additional areas if needed. It will right. totally red flag um, a part of my brain to go, okay, this is where we need to start focusing. Um, and then for her, I use a detox cube from Quicksilver Scientific, um, okay. which is really, really comprehensive, has the uh, glutathione in there, um, sort of like the catch and release when it comes to pulling mercury out. These heavy metals have such affinity for our tissues, and so I've had great success with that. So it just, for those who aren't familiar, it, it uses um, agents like glutathione, which is designed to help start to pull the mercury out of the tissues, and, and then it has binders to bind to it, things like charcoal, and then make sure that they leave the body through the stool, right? Yeah. And the urine. Um, so, um, what um, what role does um, stress have on autoimmune diseases? Oh boy, this is a big one because if you think about so stress, you know, obviously we need to quantify, it, but unhealthy, prolonged, right? Well, stress, yeah, so yeah, yeah. chronic stress, yeah, compounded, compounded, right? Those stressors, because once again, we've got this wonderful fight or flight. We've got this autonomic nervous system that can help us respond to multiple stressors. When it becomes chronic, you've got a um, sort of an over adaptation. You've got, you know, we're supposed to adapt to stressors. But when that hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access starts to over adapt, one of the things that happens is a dysregulation of the immune response, uh, which you can see in the final stages of sort of this HPA access exhaustion or 
or dysregulation. It becomes blunted. And I think that's where we start seeing um, the contribution of chronic stress to these autoimmune diseases. So uh, how, do you, how, how do you handle that? <laughs> wow. Biggest thing, yeah. I mean, what do we do? We've got to start decreasing um, and reducing our chronic stressors. Um, you know, what I have people do. Leave the modern world, go live in a shack in the woods. <laughs> yeah, well, no, right. We'll climb up to, you know, be a Zen monk. That's never going to happen for a lot of my patients. And so there's a couple things that I have people do. And for some reason, I've seen that uh, journaling and meditation have not been effective as far as that way of framing them. So I have people do you musings um, in the morning. Like, just I just want you to muse about what you want to do. And I have them do it for like three or four minutes, not a lot of time, but before they start getting connected to their devices, before they start getting connected to anything else on the outside, I want them just at least to be able to stay connected to themselves. Because I've identified a big problem. People just are so disconnected from um, themselves that when it comes to, as I said, not easy medicine, we're, we're looking at dietary interventions, we're looking at lifestyle modifications, you know, especially with stress reduction, so I have them do that. And a little other trick I have them do at the end of the day is something called a daily autopsy. Because let's face it, the day is gone. It's dead. You're never going to get it back. How did it, ha how did it go? What happened? You know, uh, you, you know did you, was there a piece of bread? Not that bread is evil or anything, but um, that you, you unconsciously sort of stuffed in your mouth at dinner. Um, after a glass of wine that you promised yourself you weren't going to have. And so those two things are really important to just frame the, the day for folks. And I just, I have them do it. We share it. We talk about it. That's really important. But of course, any other thing, meditation, whatever works for that patient, whatever for that patient is going to create a parasympathetic. That's the opposite of fight or flight. It's where we, we rest, relax, repair. Some people it's spending time with their grandchildren. Some people it's not spending time with their grandchildren. Some people it's like taking a bath, um, lighting candles, carving out time to just read a book instead of watching television. So all of those things are so important to help. Cortisol is very inflammatory, right? And we're trying to quell the inflammation. So all of those things need to be on board. That's great. We could talk about autoimmune diseases forever. I'd like to hit on one more topic. Um, uh, I'm recognizing that every patient's individual and a specific patient in your office, you would have very specific recommendations, but just in general, what are some of the more helpful dietary nutritional supplements for autoimmune diseases? Yeah, so from the research and, and, and pretty much what I see in my practice, general support, I'm looking at vitamin D, definitely getting them up to optimal levels, uh, 60 to 80. I think not just one click above rickets, which I see a lot of people coming in with their lab tests and they're like, oh, your vitamin D is within normal limits. Right. But we look for optimal. Um, definitely healing the gut. So we're looking at that friendly and good bacteria, which is part of the immune system, um, as well as the stomach acid and the gut associated lymphatic tissue. And we're looking at the gut. Essential fatty acids, I think, are important. Um, curcumin, I've written a lot about curcumin. Um, uh, especially in higher doses, potent anti-inflammatory, potent antioxidant, uh, inhibits the DNF and as well other interleukons. Um, so that I think is extremely important. Uh, resveratrol. This is actually something that folks uh, that I've been talking to from a colleague perspective, it helps to reduce oxidative stress, yes, but it also inhibits that peaceful differentiation, um, which is extremely important. And so I've really seen resveratrol uh, be quite effective in treating lupus, for sure, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto, so I use that all the time as well. 200 milligrams, 400 milligrams, how much? Uh, what did you say? How, how many milligrams? 200 milligrams, 400 milligrams? Usually 200, 200 milligrams BID, or twice a day. Okay, good. And then, you know, you're always looking at digestive health, so uh, the, the R's, we know the R's, uh, so removing those um, those microbials, those viruses, the fungus. Um, certainly, I do, I just want to touch on, because I know we're almost out of time, but Epstein-Barr virus has been indicated, especially in a, a contributing factor to the initiation etiology of Hashimoto. So I am testing for that more and getting on that as soon as possible. Any antimicrobial herbs. And are you testing for that through serum or through stool or? Through serum, yes. Okay. And I mean, and, and it's another, there, there are cases that are just ringing in my head. Once again, 
why aren't those antibodies coming down? We're doing everything that I know to do. Yeah. That virus was, I mean, this one woman, bless her heart, I've never seen uh, an Epstein-Barr, not only just reactivation of a past infection, chronic activation, um, and those titers are so high. So we needed to kind of pull our attention with antiviral support, immune support, um, really important. So I could yeah. go on and on, but those are, those are the big ones that I use. Yeah, another thing I wanted to point out, GI map from Diagnostic Solutions or stool test, we, I found that helpful with some autoimmune patients. They actually have a series of uh, potential autoimmune trigger bacteria, and sometimes that gives you some hints for things to uh, try to target, to clear out, to help reduce the... Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Okay. Good, good, good. Um, so any final thoughts and then how can everybody get a hold of you? Sure. Well, my website is always the best, just at drhollylucille.com. And for patients, I just want to say that there is hope. If we look at this um, in much more of a comprehensive way and you help get your skin in the game and partner with somebody like Ben, myself, a functional medicine doctor, a naturopathic doctor that is going to excavate and identify and treat the cause and ask those questions about why your immune system would start to attack itself. Um, there is hope, so hang in there. And then as you said, Ben, and I can't say this enough, even though my parents both being pharmacists, there are medications out there that are being given uh, every single day, these direct consumer marketing from the commercials, um, because we've got more and more autoimmune diseases, right, because of our environment and um, other contributing factors. But they do come with toxic side effects. They suppress the immune system. So we're looking at increased risk of cancer and other devastating things. So if benefit ratio, there's a better way. There's a more comprehensive way. Here, take this as easy. But if you do everything else, um, when we're looking at lifestyle, dietary, all the things that need to happen, you've got, you've got a chance for better outcomes and the quality of life that you're going to soar with. Awesome. Talk to you soon, Holly. Thank you all so right, much. Thank you so much.